All right, with that, we'll get started. Our speakers are Brittany Hunter, Horticulture Extension Assistant Professor in Davis County. Brittany has expertise in out-of-season vegetable production using high tunnel greenhouses and is interested in using biochar to benefit soils for vegetable growers in Utah. Also joining us is Dr. Jim Ippolito, research soil scientist with the USDA ARS, Northwest Irrigation and Soils Research Laboratory. His current research focuses on water quality issues in production agricultural settings and the beneficial use of byproducts such as water treatment res residuals and biochar. So with that, I will turn the time over to Brittany. Thank you. Okay, very good. You're um, just right. Well, hello everyone. I'm joining you from my office at Utah State University Extension in Farmington, Utah. Um, one of my responsibilities as an extension educator is to advise gardeners and farmers and landscapers on how to improve their soil. Um, I'm also familiar with this question having worked years for plant nurseries where people come to purchase soil improvement products. So as I began to learn about biochar, I knew that this would be a product that inevitably someone would ask me about and I wanted to have a good answer ready. Um, I was introduced to biochar by some colleagues in our forestry department that are working with pyrolysis technology to turn woody plant biomass into green energy and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I'm now collaborating with others in forestry and agriculture on a grant that would fund biochar research at Utah State and because of this, I attended the North American Biochar Symposium in Amherst, Massachusetts last fall. Um, and I learned a lot about the science of biochar while I was there. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. OK. So what is biochar? Um, for those who have not heard of this, um, biochar is a carbon-rich material. It's very similar to charcoal produced when organic solids, such as wood, are slow burned in a contained system with limited oxygen. So the, the two images we're looking at on the bottom left are uh, a pyrolysis units. The one on the far left is very advanced and the one in the middle is very basic. So there's a range of designs and what these units do is um, make this contained system where we can burn um, wood or any organic material at a very high hot temperature to where the carbon dioxide emissions are very little um, and then we can create biochar and some other byproducts. So the image on the right is uh, you can see the wood products, hardwood, rice hulls, switchgrass, and bagasse, which is from sugarcane. Um, on the bottom, that's before it goes into this um, firing kiln. And then on the top, that's what it looks like when it comes out. It's a lot lighter weight, and it's very porous. Um, but it's kind of cool. It ends up the same shape as whatever you put in. So if you put in a natural rope, for instance, it would come out looking like a charcoal rope. Um, so kind of neat. So uh, to continue with what is biochar, um, modern biochar production, this firing of wood, woody products, uh, attempts to create a soil amendment that's similar to the ancient terra preta soil in Brazil. Um, these soils that you can see um, on, in the image on the right are referred to as the Amazonian dark earth or the black earth of the Indian. And they discovered these areas, um, big areas throughout the Amazon region that range from 1 to 80 hectares. And a hectare, if you're not familiar with it, is about two and a half acres. So they're very large areas. Um, and right next to those areas that are very rich and dark soils, very fertile, are soils that are very not fertile um, because in the rainforest areas there's a lot of rainfall and a lot of leaching. Um, so typically we see the soils 
like the one on the left where they're not very fertile for growing crops. Um, so we want to look into what makes these soils so fertile. The, with the man standing on the right and his corn is about three times taller, it's dark green, um, and the soil is this, this black earth. And what it contains is charcoal and there's also bone, pottery, shards, and manure. And it's not well understood how those soil, soils were formed. Um, the, the most common understanding uh, right now is that people did make these soils, put this charcoal into the soil, and it built up to make these rich earths. Um, but it's not well understood whether they intended to do it or, um, or not. Um, so we wanted to, we want to see if we can harness that, you know, charcoal technology and, and make rich earth in our own area. Um, but that's not the only reason why we might make biochar. Um, it has other benefits such as utilizing waste, waste management, um, mitigation of climate change, energy production, um, and then also soil improvement. And I'll touch on each of these today but I'm going to focus on the soil improvement. <clears throat> so biochar for waste management. Um, this is a slide from the North American Biochar Symposium um, from Doris Hamill. She just kind of breaks down what the, how much woody plant waste we make in the US. So the EPA estimates um, 6 million tons of urban woody waste a year. Um, and you know, six million, 60 million tons of wood infested with pine beetle, um, 368 million tons of forest products, um, and 40 to 50 percent of the new residential construction waste stream is these woody products. So there's a lot of wood being that's sort of extra or being wasted. Um, we do recover that and recycle it as mulch. Um, but there's a lot of that wood out there that we could turn into biochar. And the map on the right um, shows you some the areas in the western US where we do a lot of fuel treatment thinnings, where we'll go into a forest and we'll remove the fuel or we will remove trees so that if a wildfire comes through there, it will stop and it won't have any fuel to burn. Um, so that's we do get woody waste from there as well. So if we take that wood and instead turn it into biochar, um, we end up contributing to climate mitigation. So basically, carbon emissions from the decomposition and the burning of that waste wood can instead be charred and redirected to the soil where the carbon is released very slowly and it benefits plants. Um, so the graph to the right, what we're looking at is if we have wood, um, while that tree is alive, it's um, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing that carbon. Um, after that tree dies, um, it will then release that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. Um, but if we turn that dead tree into biochar, um, we stop that process of releasing the carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, and it ends up being very stable. So that carbon is not really re-released as carbon dioxide. So we're essentially slowing down the carbon cycle. Um, biochar can also be used for energy production, or I should say pyrolysis can be used for creating energy. This is a slide from some research happening at University of California Davis with walnut shells um, being gasified at very high temperature, 900 degrees Celsius. They can then create heat, electricity, um, biofuels. That image on the right is um, sort of this tarry substance that comes out of the process and also biochar. So that's four products we could get. Um, I had to throw this in. This was one of my favorite talks from the, the conference. Um, this is, his name is Hans Peter Schmidt from the Ithaca Institute in Germany. And he had a lot of different 
uses for biochar <laughs> that are out there. Um, one very interesting one is as a soil substrate, as a peat alternative. We use a lot of peat moss in potting soils and um, we're pulling that peat moss out of the bogs faster than it's being replenished. So um, biochar is a promising alternative to that because we could actually make it. Um, mine reclamation of heavy metals is another use. Uh, dairy farm waste management, it has a, the ability to um, absorb ammonia and methane gases or reduce the, the gases that come off of, of dairy waste. Um, air and water purification, humidity regulation, um, protection against electromagnetic magnetic radiation, insulation for buildings, deodorant for shoe soles, a digestive aid, um, produce storage. So many things. On the, the top we're looking at a biochar hamburger bun <laughs> and they did feed us bio, biochar at that symposium. It was pretty tasty. Um, we're looking at a pot that has biochar as the soil substrate. Um, the brick building we're looking at is uh, a natural refrigerator. So it's packed in between some wire netting to be used as insulation. Um, on the bottom right we'll, we see a biochar paint that's been painted in a building to control humidity and block radiation. And then some, you know, shoe soles, deodorant shoe soles and, and um, skin care products. So I just thought that was really neat. There's even more than I'm showing here, but just kind of fun. Okay, finally, back to biochar for soil improvement. So biochar does a few things in the soil to benefit plants. Um, number one, it helps with water retention. Um, it, due to its porosity. It helps with soil structure by reducing compaction um, and it can help with drainage by creating more um, larger pore spaces for water to flow through. Um, chemically, it can improve the cation exchange capacity which um, just means it has a charge like a positive or negative charge and our nutrients that are dis dissolved in the soil um, also have a charge, so it helps hold on to those and keep them um, available for plants. Um, it can also alter the pH. Uh, most biochars are fairly alkaline and they vary in pH depending on how they're created. So that can be um, sort of a detriment to us in our western soils. We already have very alkaline soil, um, so we want to pay special attention to that when we're using biochar. Um, also, for the in the biological community in soil, um, biochar can help increase microbial activity um, by creating a housing for microbes and if they're busy doing their thing and thriving then they're going to help by um, processing organic matter and so those nutrients are released for the plant to use. Uh, biochar for water retention is a very big um, idea that, that sparks a lot of ideas. Um, the porosity of the biochar traps water and therefore delays drying out of soils in which it's been incorporated. Um, and there's, there's other studies out there and I know Jim is going to tell you um, more about the research that he's doing involving water retention. And, but one study that I read in particular caught my attention that biochar increased the survivab survivability of grass during a severe water stress in an Arizona pot study. So um, that's, we're looking at it not so much to say um, for huge water savings. Um, even though we could anticipate some water savings, the, the bigger idea I think with using biochar in the West is that if it is incorporated into soils, if we have these drought events, um, those plants are going to be able to better respond to it. And then as we get used to that, um, we could gradually you know, taper off the water 
Um, so the map on the right uh, just shows areas where we have drought disasters, and I'm not sure how these areas get this designation, but just as a visual aid, we all know that um, in the West we get these area, these times of drought, and in Davis County, where I am, we also had uh, water restrictions in place. So that was very hard on farmers, and biochar does show some potential to help us um, get through those hard times. Uh, here's a close-up of some biochar. I kept saying biochar is very porous. Well, um, so this is what it looks like close-up. And on the bottom, we see a, a fun fungi, and you can imagine other microbes and things using this as kind of a, a big apartment where they can thrive and um, live happily. So they, they love using this, um, the biochar. And the bottom left is a graph that just shows the soil bacteria population going up with the addition of charcoal. And this was a slide I um, took from the Biochar Research Symposium. Um, I also mentioned cation exchange capacity and nutrient holding capacity. Um, so just to reiterate that point. so. Biochar has that weak um, cation exchange capacity that helps it keep nutrients in the soil. So we could anticipate some fertilizer cost savings there. Um, and just another graph that from that walnut study that's going on that shows the increase in that. Um, for disease suppression, we are going to be looking at this in our research study for Utah. Um, if incorporated in the soil, some of those soil-borne pathogens could be inhibited um, to help protect our plants. So that's a, a really big benefit. And I actually found a product that's available right now called Tree Protector. Um, and it's got that carbon in it. And they are selling it as a way to protect that um, area of the tree right around the soil, the trunk, from getting diseases in it. OK, so biochar is awesome. Uh, I hopefully got that point across, because we can utilize wood waste. We can reduce CO2 emissions. We can create green, green energy and biofuel. And we can enhance the soil health. Um, so why don't we just use it everywhere? It seems like a win-win-win-win. Uh, um, and the number one reason for that would be not all biochar is created equal. Um, and it has a different effect in different environments. Um, so we have to look a little bit more carefully to make sure that um, it's going to be useful to us. And then economically, although we're using waste wood products, um, the technology can cost money, the transportation. And so there's other factors that affect um, you know, the, the feasibility of using it in our uh, gardens, farms, and landscapes. So the variability comes in. Uh, depending on what wood we use, depending on the feed stock is the word we use for that, um, depending on the temperature of pyrolysis, depending on how long we burn it, and depending on what we do to it before we apply it to the soil. This is a graph from um, Hugh McLaughlin, who's been doing a lot of testing of different biochar products. And um, we can see a lot of different biochars. There's some wood chips, wood pellets, um, straw, juniper, cedar. Um, just a few things to point out. Um, number one, the tall, light blue bars. Some of these products have a lot of water in them. So you could be buying a bag um, with a lot, a high concentration of just water. Um, and then uh, a very big point is that we have the green bars, which are the resident matter which is the actual biochar, the char um, carbon product. And then we have the maroon part is the mobile matter, which is tars and resins that are not quite burned off during the process. And those tars and resins can be harmful to plants. So we want to watch out for that. And I will show you how to check for those. Um, <clears throat> how it affects your plants is going to vary depending on what type of biochar you're using. So we're looking at different types of chars. 
uh, dairy manure, char, food waste, poultry um, at different rates. And as our rate increases, um, some of those biochars end up being negatively affecting plant growth for corn. And um, one of them, the poultry char, actually does continue to benefit plants. Um, so I'm just showing this to reiterate the point that um, not all of the products are equal and uh, so we want to be careful about what type of char we're using and what rate we're using. Um, the, there's been a lot of research on biochar in agriculture, um, but because of the high variability in the product and the rates, um, it's all over the place. So this graph shows a lot of different studies together and it shows their means in, in change in their crop productivity and they're mostly leaning to the side where we get an increase in crop productivity um, but some of them are negative and I think that as we figure out the specifics on how to um, how to make a char that's going to benefit our specific plants in specific situations we'll see a greater leaning towards a positive change in crop productivity. And when I say crops, it could be trees, grass, vegetables, anything. So the big take home mes message I got from the conference was to think in systems. So does it make sense to use biochar in your specific system? Um, where's your feedstock coming from? What would happen to it if it wasn't uh, turned into biochar, what's the value of the application, um, is it carbon sustainable, how much time and effort, that kind of thing. And then I have some different systems here in bubbles, for example, um, a hardwood biochar at 600C at 10 tons per hectare in an orchard, or perhaps a grass biochar that was fired at 600C at 1% in greenhouse tomato. So there's all kinds of different um, ways you can switch it around and rates. So we want to just think about that as we go to use it. And as you start to research, you might come across pictures like this where we have, here's my small, tiny plants without biochar, and here's my humongous plants with char, and here's my small plant with bio, you know, with peat, and my big plant with biochar, and again with here's my tiny plants in plain soil and here's my huge plants with biochar and I just hope that I've um, sent you with enough information that you can after you see those pictures say okay well what type of biochar were you using and how much and what else was added and in what kind of soil um, so just to get a bigger picture when you see those um, but there is a lot out there because biochar can be very powerful in uh, benefiting plants. So in Utah, um, we're looking at doing some research on how it could benefit tomato and melon productivity and also reduce soilborne diseases um, such as Phytophthora. Um, and so that, stay tuned for that. Um, potentially in Utah, we have a lot of feedstocks we could use, uh, pinion juniper, uh, beetle kill, orchard wood, cherry pits, phragmites, which is an invasive grass, and many others. And we could use that as a waste management tool for energy production, um, for soil improvement, um, etc. So our current challenge to using biochar widely is that we need a well-organized box of information, and we need a consistent way to characterize our biochar products so that you know what you're buying, or you know what you're creating. So currently, the International Biochar Initiative has some guidelines, and um, so biochar makers can use those guidelines to make sure that no toxic compounds or PCBs are being put into that biochar product. Um, and ideally, we would have guidelines that are specific to the system, so we could say to a landscaper or to say to a alfalfa farmer, you should be using this type of char at this rate, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And um, one of the speakers at the biochar symposium proposed a class designation at the bottom right, which I thought was really nice and hopefully will be there pretty soon where we could have a biochar 
and it would be it would fit into a liming class, which would be a pH um, designation, a fertility class, maybe describing how, what kind of cation exchange benefit it gives, and a particle size class. Um, so how to use biochar with a prepackaged product. Um, follow the directions. They're likely to be a blend of compost and biochar ready to use. Um, if you have a homemade or other biochar, I would recommend testing it for mobile matter or those tars and resins that are toxic to plants. A simple soap test is to put your hands on it, rub it around on your hands, and then wash your hands. And if you need soap to wash off that char residue, it likely has a lot of those tars still in it. If it washes off with just water, um, you're good. There's also a, you can do a germination test to see if those seedlings sprout up in the biochar or a worm test to see if worms avoid it. Those tests are described on the International Biochar International website, which I have a picture of on the right in the link. And then they also have on the website guidelines on practical aspects of biochar application um, to get you started if you would like to start using biochar. Um, also, before we use our biochar, we want to crush it. So it's a small particle size. We want to add water um, to hydrate it. We want to add compost or other fertilize, fertilizer as an inoculation and then incorporate it into the root zone. And for annual crops, we would incorporate it into the top six to eight inches at approximately a 1% wit rate. Um, there's lots of how-to videos on YouTube as well for people that use biochar all over the place. Um, as far as recommendations right now from USU Extension, um, we, for use in gardening and farming in Utah, um, we're still in development of those recommendations. There's no harm in trying out these products based on the label guidelines, um, but just be aware that there's going to be a high variability in, in maybe what's in there. Um, this image I have is soil reef biochar, which is made in Hawaii, and they're a, a very big producer, and they're now selling through Whole Foods. So you could probably get your hands on some of that and try it out in your garden. Um, the Biochar International website is a great way to learn more, and then I would recommend just staying tuned um, for the research that we'll be doing at Utah State, so, and we'll be informing people of, of how that goes and, and how we can use biochar in our soils. All right, that's all I have, so I don't know if we were going to do a few quick questions now or um, wait till the end. Okay. Let's do a few questions, Brittany. Um, you've got okay. some here in the chat pod. Uh, you did mention that economics was a limiting factor, or maybe a limiting factor. Um, Hal Jensen was wondering about how much it really costs, the energy costs, I guess, to produce biochar, and are there studies that that? Yeah, there's um, a lot of information out there, and unfortunately, I'd, I'm probably not the best one to give a straightforward message there. Um, the, the biggest factor in the economics is um, number one, transportation of, you know, so the, the systems that make the most sense economically are where we can make a pyrolysis technology that we can move to the place where the feedstock is. So for example, move it to the edge of the forest so we can process those waste trees right there on site, turn it into biochar, and then transport that value-added product to um, to resell somewhere else. Um, and so does that help? The, the technology, the pyrolysis technology is um, so variable right now, the, the different kilns and styles where uh, it's really hard to give a straightforward answer. Great, thanks. Um, all right, we've got another question. I know a lot of the folks here are arborists and people that are dealing with existing landscape. The um, yes, I, I think it can. Um, or other what you would landscape. do is apply it 
in, in a very fine kind of dust. You would want to grind it down really finely and then probably a, apply it, you know, with a lot of water, but it will move down into the soil. Um, but I, I haven't read a lot of studies on on doing that, but I know that that would be possible and I think it would be a great idea um, in the landscape. So, All right, and then our last question. It seems a potential soil amendment for Utah Basin gas field pads and production points. Is this is this product being considered for um, soil you mean in Utah? absorption or stuff or other uses besides just agriculture? It's definitely it's definitely being studied for a, a very wide range of, of uses. I did mention um, earlier about the mine reclamation, so for yeah. its potential to absorb heavy metals, um, for its potential to increase germination, for revegetating um, areas that have been, um, you know, invaded by weeds. Um, and the so the but the main areas of research are in the energy production, biofuels, and using it in agriculture. Um, but I think with that, we'll turn the show over to to Jim. Thanks, Brittany. Before I start, I, I just want to maybe add a little bit to that last comment about gas field pads and production points, and it was a. It looks like it was a question brought up by Scott. And Scott, I don't know if you know a person named Dusty Moeller with the University of Nevada, Reno, but he gave a presentation somewhere in Utah a couple of weeks ago about potentially using biochar for revegetation purposes on gas field pads. And so if you want me to get in contact, or you in contact with him, um, we'll find a way to connect after the seminar is over. Um, anyway, what I want to do over the next 20, 25 minutes is to give you sort of an overview of the last six to seven years of research that we've been doing up in Kimberly, Idaho, in conjunction with a number of folks across the U.S. and um, in the future around the world. And Brittany did, did a great job of introducing what the fuss is all about over biochar. And so I'm not going to really reiterate this too much. Um, she showed this, this is a classic example of an oxisol that's poor and biochar enriched. And she talked about the, the long-term benefits of, of carbon storage in soils using biochar. Um, in production agriculture, when you apply an uncharred organic material, and it doesn't have to be wood, it could be manure, for example, that tends to degrade over a short period of time. And these biochars in these soils have been carbon dated to hundreds if not thousands of years they've been in place and it's really quite amazing. So you know what we're trying to do is recreate these sort of systems in the Amazon here under temperate semi-arid to arid environments. One of the other fusses and Brittany did also a great job of mentioning this too is is trying to offset CO2 emissions and offsetting the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and this is some this is a simple graph that Johannes Lehman gave me a number of years ago and we know when plants go through photosynthesis, they capture about 50% of that CO2, and about 50% is returned to the atmosphere. They respire at night. And we can take that plant material and pyrolyze it. And essentially, if, if you look at the overall effect on the atmosphere, we can reduce carbon dioxide emissions estimated at about 20%. And so it's, it's a carbon negative cycle. And it's really, really interesting for people that are in the environmental sciences field which is another reason why we're looking at this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just, I'm not going to tell you any more background. I'm just going to jump into the research that we've done over the last six years up in Idaho and um, show you some of the highlights. I'm not, I don't have time to show you everything. And if you have questions afterwards or even down the road, feel free to contact me. So early on, one of the work that, one of the uh, projects or works we did were, it dealt with biochar and copper sequestration. And this is, this is kind of an interesting topic. We asked the question, can biochar absorb solution copper? And knowing a little bit about copper chemistry, copper in soils, when it's in soils, it tends to form very strong associations with organic material. Well, biochar is organic, so why can't copper form a strong association with, bio, with biochar? 
And so early on we used um, something really strange. I mean, this isn't a wood-based biochar, a traditional wood-based biochar. It's potassium hydroxide steam-activated pecan shell biochar that we obtained from some colleagues in Florence, South Carolina. And here's the story in Idaho. So in the Magic Valley in South Central Idaho, we have, um, over the last 15, 20 years, we've seen a pretty strong increase in the dairy cow population. I mean, it's linear. And right now it's been hovering over the last few years around 500,000 dairy um, cattle or dairy cows. And this is the story. So at these dairies, not all the dairies, but some of these dairies use copper sulfate hoof baths to prevent hoof diseases. And so these dairy cows, when they, when they leave the milking parlor, they walk through a hoof bath that contains somewhere between 5 and 10 percent copper as copper sulfate. And that's 10, that's up about 12,000 to 25,000 parts per million copper. Well, once that hoof bath is spent, it gets dumped into the waste lagoon, where it can form associations with the organic phases present. But about 5 to 10 percent of the copper is still available. And what typically is occurring in these waste lagoons, these waste lagoons are used for irrigation purposes on, you know, um, just a limited number of center pivots. And so under these field conditions, we can really see copper problems building up to the point where, in fact, some of our sandy soils in south central Idaho have a copper toxicity um, issues. And so what we're trying to do is stop this from occurring. And so we've done some lab work, and I'm not going to show you all the data, but I'll show you some of the data here. This is the highlight of the data. And what we did was we added increasing amounts of copper to a certain amount of biochar. So you see the increasing amounts of copper on the x-axis. And you look on the y-axis, and you'll see the copper the amount of copper absorbed to the biochar. And the blue dots are the observed values, and the solid line is the predicted curve. And this is pretty typical of um, all of the materials I've worked with over the last 20 to 25 years. You can, you typically see an absorption uh, maximum occurring. And if you plot that, if you look in the top right-hand corner, or on the top of the graph, it gives you this crazy equation. And the bottom line is, is that this biochar that we use can absorb about 42,000 parts per million copper. Well, heck, that's a, lot, that's a lot of copper that we could be absorbing and potentially recapturing and reusing at some of these dairies. And so that's, that's the concept for this project. Another project that we, we performed early on dealt with biochar and soil physical improvements. And we asked the question, can biochar improve soil water holding capacity? This is pretty important in our western U.S. soils when, you know, we have these, these times where we have either deficit irrigation if you're in production agriculture or, you know, you're in, a, in some other environment. And this is what we did. We, we performed a pot study with switchgrass biochar. We pyrolyzed that material at either a low temperature or a high temperature. And you can see um, at the low temperature, you typically have biochars that tend to have an, an acidic pH whereas at higher temperatures, they tend to be a little more alkaline. So maybe this answers one of the questions that Hal brought up early on. In any event, we added 2% biochar by weight to two different soils found here in the western U.S. And these soils were saturated and allowed to freely drain over a 10-day period. And we repeated that, that leaching four times during the, the project. What I show you here is just the first leaching event. But the second, third, and fourth leaching events were almost identical to the first. And what you see here is on the x-axis, the days after leaching, or the days after saturation, and on the y-axis, the percent soil moisture content. The green line is the high temperature biochar. The red line is the low temperature. And in both instances, those biochars actually increased the soil moisture content over the control. And what we did was, in this study, we did a back-of-the-envelope calculation based on ET rates at these two different sites for these soils over a growing period. And we found that if you use either one of these biochars, you could extend the days between irrigation events from between, say, half a day to two and a half days. And so that may be really important if you're a producer and you're worried about the amount of water you have to use during a growing season. One of the larger projects that we started in the fall of 2008 was a field study using a hardwood biochar. And we asked the question, can biochar improve calcareous soils? And I'm, I'm not going to show you any of the data in terms of soils because I just don't have time. But we've been monitoring changes over the last five to six years 
um, pertaining to soil physical chemical ch properties, biological changes, so microorganisms, micro, uh, microbiology of the system, yields, and greenhouse gas emissions. And what I want to show you are the yields. And so I'm going to show you corn yields from 2009 and 2010. And so what we did at this site was we had a control, so nothing added, a manure application at 20 tons per acre, biochar applied at about 10 tons per acre, and the manure and biochar combined together at those rates. And we, we measured yield. This is corn silage yield from 2009 and 10. And in, uh, I should mention that these materials were applied in the fall of 2008. So this is the first growing season in 2009 following application, and then the second growing season. You see in 2009 there were no differences in yield, but in 2010 we saw a significant decrease with the biochar application. I didn't have time to modify this graph, but in 2011, 12, and 13 there, there were no differences in yield again. But there was a delayed response due to biochar application that was negative. So if you were a producer, um, you probably wouldn't want to see this in a production agricultural setting. What this means is you're going to have to offset this with some additional fertilizer. And I failed to mention, but all these plots received a fertilizer application prior to planting that corn. Well, let me, let me show you some pictures, because pictures are worth a thousand words. And so in the background, you can pick out the chlorotic biochar from a distance. So our treatments are lined up linearly from, from left to right. And if you get up close and personal with these plants, the biochar corn is, is pretty chlorotic. And you can see that if you compare those pictures to the manure or the manure plus biochar application. And what we found was this was due to limited uptake of nitrogen as well as sulfur in these biochar corn plants. And we just didn't see it in any other years. It's just a one-time response, which was really interesting. So other biochar studies that we've performed We've looked at tamarisk, lodgepole, and switchgrass biochar and their use for sorbing heavy metals from Colorado and Idaho mine tailing soils. And I can tell you that all three of these, and I'm assuming other biochars as well, do an excellent job of reducing the bioavailability of heavy metals in some of these mine tailing soils, like lead, copper, zinc, and to me, mostly uh, the most interesting, cadmium. I've worked in studies where we've had a heck of a time reducing bioavailable cadmium in mine land soils. And, and these three biochars work wonderfully. I can't tell you the mechanism. We're still working that out. But they reduce bioavailable cadmium as well. We've looked at a six-month incubation study with a low temperature, low pH grass biochar added to an eroded calcareous soil. And the concept was to add this low pH material to a high pH soil to reduce the pH and increase micronutrient availability. And uh, we just didn't see it because our soils are so buffered in South Central Idaho, unfortunately. But it's still an interesting concept. And the other study that I want to just um, hit one highlight from is this 12-month incubation study that we did that we, we sort of bracketed our field application rates that I showed you in the previous slide. We applied 0, 1, 2, and 10% hardwood biochar to these small pots, either with or without a 2% manure. And the 2% and the 1% application rates of uh, manure and biochar are exactly what we did in the field. And we looked at a number of constituents in the study. It's about to be published in the Journal of Environmental Quality. And I want to show you one thing that I think is really interesting. This deals with microbial community structure in these systems. Now, this figure is really, really busy. but the thing I want to point out, you, well, let me, let me take a step back. So what you're looking at here are dots or different, different symbols of increase in biochar application rates. If you look at the legend, this is without the manure. And we monitored these pots for changes in microbial community over time. So at two months, four months, six months, and 12 months, we used a procedure called FAME analysis. And it's, it's called fatty acid methyl ester analysis. And what it does is it looks at the cell signature of different microorganisms. And you can tell what microorganisms are present or absence, are absent. And if you look at this graph, you notice that the diamonds, it doesn't depend on the month, but the diamonds all tend to congregate on the right-hand side of this graph. And if you look at the FAME analysis, what this is telling you is that there's a shift in the microbial community structure from low applications of biochar to high applications of biochar. 
And it's telling us that we have less bacteria at the lower application rates and greater bacteria qu concentrations or quantities at the higher application rate. And we actually have more fungi at the lower application rates and less fungi at the higher application rates. The biochar, what it's doing is it's causing a stress in the system at 10%, which is a heck of a lot of biochar that I would never recommend to anyone. That's about 200 tons per acre. Um, that's the beauty of doing research is we can push the boundaries. But at that application rate, you stress the system so much that you, you actually have a reduction in the amount of fungi present. And this is a, a really classic example of fungi inhabiting a biochar. And people have talked about biochar being um, you know, a microhabitat for fungi. Well, at these application rates, they're, they're probably not inhabiting biochar. They're, they're being forced out. So I just thought I'd throw that out there, just so you know that depends on the application rate that you apply as to what happens with the microbial community. What I really want to focus on for the, this uh, next 10 minutes is a project that we started a couple years ago dealing with pinion pine and juniper biochar in Nevada. And I think this is interest, it would be of interest to um, this group today because we have this problem here in Utah as well, the, the pinion juniper encroachment. And so I'll just jump right into it. We use four different soils from northeastern Nevada. Two soils were from production agricultural settings um, south and east of Ely, Nevada on a site that's owned by the Southern Nevada Water Authority. We pulled the soil from Diamond Valley, which is just a little bit north of Eureka, Nevada. This soil came from an area under alfalfa production in a low-lying portion of this field that's pointed out in the top right where nothing was growing. It was uh, definitely salt affected. It had salt crust on the surface. And we wanted to see if biochar could do anything to improve that soil. And the last soil we pulled from, if you want to call it soil, is from the Ruby Hill mine just outside of Eureka. This is a open pit gold mine. And the soil, if you want to call it that, was extracted from about 7 to 100 feet below grade and just dumped on the soil surface. And we wanted to see if we could do anything to improve that soil. So I have some nice pictures here that show sort of what we do or what we did. And in particular, we took these four soils and we used either pinion pine or juniper, juniper biochar. We separated the two plant species and charred them at 500 degrees C. And then we had four application rates in these pots, 0, 1, 2, and 5% by weight. And that's roughly equivalent to 10, 20, and 50 tons per hectare. This was replicated four times. Everything was randomized, although it's not here in the picture. And if you look at the picture, the first four pots in the front are the control. The next four are the 1%, then 2%, then 5%. Then it's repeated in these other pots. To just give you a little visual as to what it looks like. The pots were destructively sampled over a four-month period, and we analyzed these soils for nitrate, nitrogen, changes in pH and electrical conductivity or salt content, available micronutrients, soil moisture content, and we performed a germination test with alfalfa. And this is what we found, and this is going to be the general theme for the next few slides. On the x-axis, you'll see it split with pinion at 0, 1, 2, and 5% by weight, or juniper at 0, 1, 2, or 5% by weight. And on the y-axis, it's unfortunately it's cut off, but on the y-axis is the constituent of concern. In this case, it's soil nitrate nitrogen. And then you have the four graphs from, left to, uh, from top left to right and bottom left to right, which is month one through four. And this one, one soil in particular, SNWA number two, followed what I would consider a pretty typical trend of what we see when we increase biochar application rates to soils. And that is, when you increase the biochar application rate, you tend to see a decrease in the amount of soil nitrate nitrogen present. And this has been attributed to a number of things. Probably the most important, important one is immobilization. So you're adding uh, a carbon source that may have some readily available carbon substrate for microorganisms to use. And then they immobilize soil nitrate nitrogen in their, in their tissues, in their bodies. The other thing that we're exploring, this is relatively new, but we think that biochar is actually adding free electrons to this system, and it's causing the denitrification of nitrogen, of nitrate nitrogen, and that is being blown off as nitrogen gas. 
and that's something that's relatively new on the horizon. So stay tuned. This next graph shows you the change in pH. These two biochars had a pH of about um, 8.6 to 8.7. These soils were, at least this soil in particular, had a pH of about 7.5. And, and we see subtle changes in pH, no greater than usually about two-tenths of a pH unit. And so if you're concerned about changes in pH, at least in these soils, um, at least the biochar application rates that we would recommend, which would be one to two tons per acre, you're really not going to see a change in that soil's pH. If you look at changes in electrical conductivity, this is SNWA number one. And we typically see over time no real significant change in pH. During this particular study at month two, we did see a, a significant decrease in pH, but it didn't last. And it's really interesting if you look at, and I'm going to pull up the next slide here. This is the Diamond Valley soil. This soil had an initial pH of somewhere between, I'm sorry, initial electrical conductivity of between about 6 and um, 9 deci siemens per meter. And at month two, we saw a significant decrease in the electrical conductivity. Unfortunately, we didn't see that at, at month one or three or four. But this tells us that there is something going on. And then there's, there's actually a study that just came out by, I think, Thomas in 2013 that showed that biochar can actually sorb some of these salts that are present in systems. And so this probably needs further, um, further research. Available micronutrients in this system. In these four soils, we found that iron and nickel concentrations in these systems tended to increase with increasing application rate, but it really didn't increase that much. We're only talking about 1 and 0.2 parts per million. So if you have a system that's, say, calcareous, and you're having problems with iron deficiency symptoms, adding biochar is probably not going to be the solution. I show you this graph of SNWA number 2 soil because we found at month 3, and this, this holds true for month 1, 2, and 4 as well, we saw a decrease in zinc concentrations. You, you can't see this on the y-axis, but this, this is DTPA extractable zinc, or plant available zinc, if you will. And we saw a decrease with increasing biochar application rates over the control. And that's interesting because in, in these soils, if you're growing alfalfa, zinc would be considered low for growing alfalfa if the, the concentration in the soil was less than 0.8 parts per million. Well, the soil already starts out at a concentration lower than that value. And adding biochar certainly doesn't um, contribute to, to that problem. Some other available micronutrients. These graphs show you available manganese. And this is pretty typical. Um, increasing biochar application rates increase available manganese. We've seen this actually in our research, in our field research, and in all of our other pot studies. We've seen this, ex this exact response. And this is sort of important because if you have a problem with manganese, um, biochar is probably going to be a, a good answer to solving that problem. It's not typical, but it could, it could be an answer. Now, Jim, I hate to cut you off. You're on such a roll, but we've got about two minutes technically and okay. probably maybe a few questions here. Um, that people are interested in. So I don't know how much longer you've got, oh, but yeah, maybe if we could left. wrap up the presentation in five minutes. So um, these are, I think, the most important two slides for the Western US. And it Great. deals with soil moisture content and germination, and probably plant sustainability. When we looked at these soils, we see these are the four soils, SNWA number one, two, the Diamond Valley, and the Ruby Hill soils. And this is data averaged over time. In every instance, adding biochar increased the soil moisture content of these systems. And we've seen this in a lot of other systems that we've studied. And this is really important for Western U.S. soils where we have um, issues with drought, et cetera, or in production agriculture if you're talking about deficit irrigation. And I'm just going to jump to the last slide here. What we did was in this system, we did a germination test. And I'll give you the lowdown. I won't give you the highlights. I'll just give you the straightforward up on this. We compared the SNWA number one and two soils to our germination, and we found a significant correlation, a positive correlation, which says to us that it looks like when you apply biochar, at least at the one and two percent biochar application rates, 
you're going to see a significant um, um, response in, term of, in terms of germination. And that's really important as, uh, you know, from a production agricultural setting. Be happy to answer any questions. All right, you've got a handful of questions here in the chat pod. Let me scroll back up here. Um, is there a temperature yeah, that's a good that would question. produce a um, pH of 7? There, there probably Bioshock is. It's probably know. somewhere between, if I had to guess off the top of my head, first of all, it probably depends on the feedstock that you're using, but it also would be somewhere probably between, probably around 400 degrees Celsius. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it would be much higher. And that's based on some of the research I've seen. We have a, we have a um, book chapter coming out here that deals with biochar properties and, and looking at, oh, I don't know, maybe 80 different biochars. It looks like a, it would probably be around 350 to 400 degrees Celsius. All right, great. Jamie Kirby out of Montana has a question. Has there been any observation on the response well, that's a of good a tree or too, plant and, that was treated um, with biochar then transplanted to a different Not that location? I know of, but some folks that I'm working with are either thinking about doing that in Nevada or are going to do that in Nevada over um, on the southwest portion of Nevada and some, on some lands out that way. But I, I haven't heard of a study that's actually done that. I've seen, I've seen studies that have used biochar for, for tree growth with positive responses but not transplanting to a different location. I just got a message from David Howlett in Nevada saying that they did get funding for that. So um, if people are interested in finding out more about that can, study, um, where's the best place to go for information on that in the future to follow up there on are that? There are several people that are working on that. One person, his name is Dusty Muller, and he works for the University of Nevada, Reno, out of Las Vegas. His first name is actually Elmer, but he goes by Dusty. You can always contact Scott Bell with the U.S. Forest Service down in Ogden, Utah as well. Okay, great. This is another question, and maybe it's, it was kind of covered again. For urban tree applications, any idea of that, a maximum that's, that's percent a biochar and, amendment for yeah, I think it was either yesterday or the day before I was reading something where some folks in, I believe, Chicago were using biochar for urban tree planting. And I don't think they exceeded maybe 1% or 2% biochar application rate by weight, and that's uh, a 1 or 2% is either 20 or 40 tons per acre. And then, you know, of course, you'd have to probably do some back of the envelope calculations to figure out how much you would need to put into a container or some sort of area in the ground. But um, if you have questions about that, I'm, I can help you with those. It's not that big of a deal. I'm, I'm more than willing to do that. All right, great. We, questions keep coming. All right, Scott Zeidler wants to know, cheekgrass yeah, that's, that's a great question invasion too, and biochar introductions, around this idea. are there any correlation? About two years ago, we had a brainstorming session with the Forest Service and the USDA Agricultural Research Service. And, you know, and I don't know if anybody's actually done any of that work, but some of the, some of the work that has been coming out with cheekgrass invasion, and, and Scott, maybe you know this, but, you know, if you add just an easily degradable carbon source to the system, like glucose, for example, um, you can reduce cheatgrass invasion because you reduce the amount of soil nitrate and nitrogen that's present. Well, biochar could probably do the same thing, but then thinking about revegetating that area and um, timing for fertilizer application after the fact and timing of seed mix application, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I don't think anybody's really addressed it yet. All right, sounds like there's a lot more research to be done. I've got two more questions. Sounds like biochar pH is not an issue yeah, so to the buffering capacity of the soil. It, it can be, what is this or it can't be, and it depends on, in my opinion, it probably depends more on the soil itself. So in, the, in south central Idaho, for example, our soils have, oh my gosh, anywhere between 5 to 10 percent free lime, and that keep, that, that's, that's huge in terms of buffering capacity. So if you take a substance like biochar, like in our project where we added this low temperature biochar to this soil that has a huge buffering capacity, you're not going to really change the pH of that system because it's, it's fixed basically at, at pH 8. But I've, I've seen some instances where the pH can change by almost one pH unit if you add biochar to, say, a sandy soil that has very low buffering capacity. And so it's, it's, it's more likely soil dependent. 
than it is biochar dependent. All right, great. Dennis Warnwood would like to know, were any of the biochars you used charged, inoculated with any nutrients prior to application? Yeah, that's, that's a great would question, too. Would you anticipate too, and this different is, results with regards to nutrients This is the direction that we're going with our research. So biochar. we landed a grant in, um, in Nevada to do some more on-field trials to follow up our POT study. And what we're doing is we're charging biochar with, with manure during the composting treatment. And so we're going to be applying this mixture that's been composted to some soils along with biochar by itself or compost by itself. And I would anticipate that we're going to see a, a drastic response with that charged material. Um, it, others have seen the same response. Uh, there's a person named Jonah Levine out of Colorado. He works for, I believe, Biochar Solutions. And he's done some great work with this, with charging, with charging biochar and adding it to soils. I think it's it's the direction that we need to go if we're going to be working with woody biomass and woody chars in the future.